And a thank you also to the Shulman for allowing us to have this meeting here. So I'm now going to call upon Michael Joe to say a few words. I think the general idea is for a question and answer session. So it's not so much hearing, certainly not me, uh, and certainly not hearing too much from Michael initially, but we will want to ask him the questions, and I'm quite sure he will have all the answers on any subject, not necessarily education, but I know we'll be interested in that particularly, but whatever you want to ask about, we going on at the moment, all the political issues, this is the time, this is the place to do it. Michael, over to you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to emphasise that uh, I'm here because I think Matthew's been an outstanding uh, member of Parliament. Um, I think he's done a fantastic job, both in acting as an advocate for his constituency, but also in making sure that um, when issues need to be raised and brought to the attention of ministers, whether it's in education, foreign affairs, home affairs, that reflect on the, the needs and the concerns of his constituents, there's no one who worked harder, no one who's more dedicated, and I hope that you'll enjoy support from people who are natural conservatives and others who just want a highly effective constituency MP um, in the next five years. Um, I would at this stage explain why it's wise that we keep David Cameron in number 10 Downing Street. I hope we'll have a chance in the question and answer session that follows to tease out some of the issues that I think are going to be really important in this election campaign. But I wanted to make sure that, uh, given you've all been good enough to give up time in the middle of a busy day to come along here, that you felt that you had the opportunity to ask Matthew and I all the questions that are to be genuinely important on behalf of yourself, your friends and neighbours. Okay, we can take some questions for Mark. Right. Okay. okay. Questions? Yes. Uh, what's the Conservative Party's view on the current negotiations with Iran? And are they more closely aligned with the uh, Prime Minister of Israel or Iran? We're part of the negotiating team, the, the, the five plus one nations that are trying to secure a deal. But I think we're all uh, concerned about um, ensuring that if there is any deal, that we have uh, effective inspection and compliance afterwards. One of the concerns that I think many of us have is that the, uh, the fact that you have a smiling Iranian um, uh, president um, whose manners are significantly better than his predecessor doesn't mean that there's necessarily a fundamental change of heart, um, uh, particularly at the top of the Iranian regime. <coughs> we know that it's the Supreme Leader who ultimately decides what uh, shape foreign policy will have, and we know in the past there have been uh, occasions where there have been uh, what looked like olive branches extended to the West, but in fact there have been attempts to get the West to drop its own guard as well. But we also know that the sanctions regime has had an impact in Iran. And on top of the sanctions regime, the uh, oil price uh, fall, which uh, it seems an odd thing to say our allies in Saudi Arabia have helped bring about, our you know, hours and um, has put real pressure on the Iranians. Um, and I think it's a good thing that we haven't said uh, that we had to secure a deal by the absolute deadline that there are additional pressures being placed on the Iranians in order to ensure that any deal that is secured is a reasonable. Um, Prime Minister Netanyahu has pointed out that a better deal might be available um, if we were to walk away at this stage and to place even tougher sanctions on the Iranians. But I think it's also fair to say that the Americans do worry that if we don't um, secure a deal this time round, that there are some countries that observe those sanctions at the moment that may say that they won't observe them in the future because they need to see the sanctions as a means of securing a deal rather than uh, an alternative to a deal. My own view is that we need to ensure that we get the uh, inspection after any agreement that is required in order to make a deal worthwhile, because my concern is that the posture of the Iranians in so many other parts of the Middle East suggests that they're not really um, uh, the trusted partners for peace that we would all want them to be. Can I, can I just add to that as well? Because I've taken a very keen interest in this. This is one of my, my biggest concerns uh, in terms of international issues. And I, I had a Westminster Hall debate on this and certainly teased out the government's view on, on uh, Iran. Um, and most recently, the last time I, I questioned the Prime Minister, I raised this issue when he spoke at his European uh, side meeting. And uh, I, I asked him about the deal, and I said that uh, it's better to have no deal than a bad deal. And I said the difference between a, a nuclear Iran in terms of its uh, civilian capacity and its military capacity was a very short road. And I was more reassured by the Prime Minister's sentiment and what he said to me. 
but I can assure you it's something that I'm very, very concerned about and I, I am really to continue to focus upon as well. Does, does the British government there have a veto on any, any deal that is proposed? Does each of the countries have a veto? We can always walk away. I think it has been the case, without revealing too much about the process, that at different times Britain and indeed France have brought their influence to bear in order to make sure that we get a good deal. Okay, any more questions? It must be. It will be. Yeah, Martin. Under the guise of human rights and uh, animal uh, welfare, um, a, fundamental, a couple of fundamental uh, principles of our faith, that is, circumcision uh, and ritual slaughter, are being threatened from various sources in the UK and in Europe. Can you assure us that the in future Tory government will significantly support our um, feelings on, on both these subjects, and not by kicking into long grass to uh, focus groups and, uh, uh, and committees and such like, but actually thoroughly trash any uh, opposition uh, that, that we have. Absolutely. There is no chance that uh, the Conservative Party will um, in any way uh, uh, make it uh, possible to ban or restrict um, uh, current appropriate ritual slaughter. So Shakita is, is absolutely safe under a Conservative government. Um, uh, and uh, one of the reasons why I can say that with such confidence is that I know that in the, in the past, the Prime Minister um, uh, had an opportunity to meet um, uh, Diane Erendroy, um, and they discussed these issues among many others. Indeed, I think it was the, uh, the Diane who was able to point out that the Prime Minister, um, if you go um, sufficiently far back, not that far back, um, uh, has Jewish ancestors from the Levitas family. Um, anyway, as well as discussing their genealogy, um, they also discussed precisely these threats, some from the militant animal rights lobby, some from other lobbies, to um, the traditions of the Jewish faith. And the Prime Minister is absolutely clear, um, uh, as, as we are, that religious freedom needs to be respected, and that means that there is absolutely no way that we're going to give in to animal rights militants in uh, curbing the uh, traditional uh, uh, freedoms and rights of people within the Jewish religion in order to have um, uh, kosher uh, principles maintained. And, and on certain decision, I should say the same thing applies absolutely. The Prime Minister has the largest um, Shahid Abitwan in the country, yes. in his constituency, so it's in his interest to keep it. Well, that's all very well. I, I'm, I'm sure what you say is true. But if there should be a circumstance in the next five years, for example, as the newspapers are saying, that Mr. Cameron is no longer the leader of the Cameron mm. Party, is no longer the Prime Minister, and some other personality mm. becomes the leader of the party, then of course the um, things might change. And in that case, I think, can I ask you a, a sort of an impertinent question mm. of uh, Mr. Offer? If there should be a move in Parliament and a three line whip, mm. maybe, that they should force increase signing before Twitter. Would you defy a three line whip? Sitting next to the chief whip. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say yes. <laughs> and sit next to the chief whip, he will know that it's not the first time, and on occasion I have voted against the government when I felt it was appropriate for this constituency. Um, certainly, uh, we had a debate on Palestine very recently. The Labour Party whipped their MPs <coughs> to vote for it. Our stance, because we could not guarantee majority, because ministers don't vote on backbench business, it was a backbench debate, we abstained the party. I didn't. I voted, I spoke against the, the motion, and I voted against the motion. I do what I think is right for constituents. I'm here to represent you, not the Conservative Party, and I do that. I believe that on the whole, I do represent the Conservative Party by the way I vote in Parliament. But the answer is I would vote uh, against such a motion, but I don't believe that will ever come about. Okay. Uh, uh, one thing I should say is that the Prime Minister has said that he'd um, want to serve a full second term. So um, I, I think that throughout the lifetime of the next Parliament, uh, Matthew's not going to be put in, in, in that position. Yeah. And I can't imagine um, any leader of the Conservative Party, uh, who knows, but I can't imagine any leader of the Conservative Party <laughs> from among the people I know who are potential contenders uh, giving him office. <coughs> Can I um, broaden the discussion to the EU? Mm. Um, the two things, um, we were promised um, as an election pledge 
last time, except that there would be a curve or some sort of limitation or control over immigration from, else, from other parts of the EU, and that hasn't come about. <coughs> um, but, but, um, can you answer that first? I'll come back to the second question. Absolutely. Um, I think our pledge at the last election was to bring down net migration um, so that uh, it was the tens, not the hundreds of thousands. Uh, the difficulty with that is that even though we did for much of the Parliament bring down migration from outside the EU, it was migration from inside the EU that rose. And the principal reason it rose is the Eurozone countries performed more uh, psychologically, economically, um, as a result of um, uh, their failure to take the necessary steps after the, the Great Recession in 2008, and our economy has been more and more successful. So we generated 1.9 million new jobs in this country, and many of those jobs were taken up by people who were in uh, European countries where there simply weren't the opportunities for employment. Now, I don't want this country to um, move backwards economically. I want us to continue to be able to, to generate jobs and growth. Uh, but we also need to do take some steps in order to ensure that we can limit migration from the EU. And that's one point I to have uh, outlined in uh, December. Um, uh, a series of steps that he would take if we were re-elected. But we're only going to be in a position to take all of those steps if we have a majority Conservative government. Because one of the things, I'm sure Matthew will reinforce this point, that I've found is that even though lots of good things have been achieved in this coalition, there are some areas where the Liberal Democrats have stopped us doing what we believed was right. And one of those areas was with respect to some of the changes in migration that we wanted to make. Mm -hmm. that is, that's very true. Michael certainly has been privy to some conversations that I haven't. But coming up on the doorstep, a lot of people are talking about inheritance tax. And um, we certainly have a view. We've increased it for, to £350,000 for an individual, £600,000 for a couple. But we'd certainly like to see that go further. And the reason for that is because the, our homes in this area are substantially more um, valuable than in other parts of the country for lots of different reasons. We're finding that people here are being caught by an inheritance tax. So after paying tax for years and years and years, they have been uh, penalised once again uh, upon the death of, of, of their loved one. And certainly that is an area that we are completely out of line with the Liberal Democrats. And certainly we would like to go further in terms of uh, taking more people out of that and paying their inheritance tax. Can I come back on that point? Of course. Um, that, that's not really relevant to the immigration from the No, 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 it's just an example. It's just, just, just a side issue as well what you propose to do in the next government, but uh, th there could be controls and, and uh, perhaps even without asking the um, commission to, or whatever current, to change the law, simply to put in place that um, within this country, immigrants from other parts of the EU should not find it so easy to come here. They shouldn't immediately be able to get onto benefits the same as people who've been resident for, for years, things like that. Um, that, that's, that's one answer. That brings me on to the other question I was going to ask, um, which is um, whether there is any definite, um, concrete plan for um, controlling the ways in which we are, um, uh, we have voices upon us, lots of rules and regulations from the Commission. Um, that, that, that are contrary to what we would want to have here, what is the, what is the next government going to do about it if it's a Conservative government? Um, if it's a Conservative government, then we will operate a principle which means that for every new regulation that is put forward, two existing regulations have to go, so that the country will have, at the end of five years, less red tape, and that will apply to European regulation as well. Can that be enforced over the uh, Commission? Well, that's the demand we're going to make. The European Commissioner in charge of regulation, or deregulation, better regulation, is a gentleman called Franz Timmermans. He said that he wants to support um, uh, a deregulatory drive, so we're going to see if um, uh, he will stick to that promise, and we're going to be very determined in making sure that that promise sticks. And that goes on to call the human rights, isn't it? It falls outside the, the ECHR, so it's, it's, it's a commission decision, and it's, it's basically saying that the, uh, the flow of regulations and directives um, has to move into reverse. So doesn't every member of you require to give, uh, to give a positive um, answer to that? If you have one uh, 
who rejects it, the whole thing is okay? When it comes to treaty change, yes, that's true. So if you want to uh, fundamentally change the operation of any of the European treaties, then you need to do it through unanimity. But when it comes to thinking about the, the stock and flow of regulations that we have, then it's the Commission that's in the driving seat. And if we can change the attitude in the Commission, and Franz Dimmons has said that he wants to take a different view, then uh, there's a possibility of um, Britain being in a, and all countries in the European Union, being in a, uh, a position to benefit from a deregulatory drive. And that's part of what we want for our renegotiation of the European Union. But the Commission has been very fast uh, uh, in instituting new regulations, hundreds and hundreds mm. of years now. Uh, in deregulating, it's a uh, very, very bad concern. Because right. regulations justify the whole, the whole, way, the whole way to enter. The whole reason of existence is to, to make all the race. They're not going to make this sort of thing down. Two things. Firstly, within the, uh, uh, the British government, we applied, first of all, the principle of one in, one out, and then one in, two out to, to, to regulation. It hasn't been um, an easy process because, as you point out, bureaucracies exist to make new rules. Um, but it's worked. Um, and we have both an opportunity now, given what the Commission themselves have said, um, and also a determination on the part of our ministers to get that deal. That's what we're fighting for. Ready again? Well, another aspect of the EU uh, question relates to a foreign policy in that the uh, Commission seems to wish to get much more into uh, foreign policy on behalf of the EU than ever before. And um, one of the uh, uh, issues which we think the EU Commission as a whole is maybe less sympathetic to Israel and its situation than, than here before. Mm. To what extent would the Conservative government be able to either influence or in some way stop or in some way alter uh, the present uh, commissioner and any future European Commissioner for Foreign Affairs who has quite the same sympathy as many gentlemen have. Yes. Um, I think that uh, we can overstate sometimes the capacity of the European Union to act as a single player in uh, foreign affairs. It's still the case that um, uh, Angela Merkel or Francois Hollande or David Cameron matter more in foreign policy than the lady who is the, uh, the, the current uh, high representative. I don't think it's any um, reflection on uh, the people in this room. If I were to ask who that lady was, <laughs> I suspect most people wouldn't be able necessarily to name her. Angela Ashton. No, no, no. Indeed, sadly, or perhaps no. why? Happily, she's dead on. She's dead on. It's a lady called uh, Signora Mogherini from Italy. Um, um, and, and most people, quite rightly, um, uh, lead busy lives, and uh, Signora Mogherini wouldn't have flashed across their, uh, their radar screens. Um, but my point, my serious point, is that um, when the big nations within the European Union decide to act together, as for example they have over Russia and the vital importance of sanctions against Putin, then we can work effectively together. Um, sometimes it's the case that the, uh, the European Union, um, if we've got the right principles animating it, can be a force for good, but sometimes it's the case that Britain or France or Germany feels the need to act not through a European um, uh, set of institutions, but bilaterally or multilaterally, but without invoking the EU. Um, there are also questions, as I'm sure many people here will be aware, about the way in which the EU uses aid money and the way in which some of that money is distributed within the Palestinian uh, uh, territories. Um, but I think that there is a broader question which relates not just to the EU, but also relates to how various charities and development organisations see the conflict and see their role. Um, and it requires sensitive handling to make sure that people who do give money in order to genuinely secure the relief of suffering amongst individuals don't find that their money is converted into uh, political campaigning funds. You, sorry, can I, you seem to have re-fenced a number of heads of expenditure going forward in which health and education and overseas aid come to yes. mind. But you've studiously seemed to have ducked the commitment to the 2% NATO target for defence spending. Mm. 
And as the defense of the realm is arguably the government's first duty, mm -hmm. I, for one, find this very disturbing. Yes. Well, I think you're absolutely right to say that there are some areas which have been um, ring-fenced and will be ring-fenced in the next parliament. Health and international development are two. Um, per pupil spending is a third. Um, on defense, we're currently meeting the requirement to spend 2% of our oh. GDP on defense. Um, and I think the only other NATO nation that spends, comparable NATO nation that spends more is, of course, the United States of America. Um, and uh, one of the problems with the 2% target with respect to defense is that as our economy grows, then uh, the meeting the 2% target means um, a more investment in defense, as it were, come what may. If our economy were to shrink, then we could meet the 2% target, and yet we would still, perhaps, I think, not be spending a sufficient amount in order to secure our defences. I think the best way of answering the question about how much we should spend on defence is to make a, a realistic assessment of where we need to invest in the future. There are two things that the Prime Minister has said, which I think are sensible, um, which relate to future commitments. One is the size of the army. That's not going to drop below 82,000. The second is um, the money that we spend on kit. Um, that's ring fence in real terms, because whatever else happens, we want to make sure that um, our soldiers, sailors, um, and the airmen have uh, up-to-date and effective uh, In the first year of uh, any new government, there will be a uh, defense review, strategic defense and security review, and that will give us an opportunity to decide, uh, partly in consultation with our allies, partly by making sure that we're uh, being realistic about um, uh, where future threats can, can emanate from, uh, we can then decide what it is that we need to do in order to keep this country safe. And there are, as has been reported, some things that I think that we need to invest in, which count as defence of the realm, but don't count as defence expenditure. And one of the areas that I would mention most importantly is um, domestic intelligence and security. Um, defence against terrorism involves investment in MI5, MI6, and GCHQ, which quite properly uh, is encountered within the traditional defence um, uh, budget, but is just as important to making sure that um, the people of this country are kept safe. I do suggest that you need to take this defence review much more open-mindedly and seriously than you did in 2010, which turned out to be simply a matter of economics and, and politics to many of us. And if you don't take it seriously, I think you'll pay a very heavy price. I think you're absolutely right that it needs to be taken very seriously. And I, um, I, I was simply reading yesterday in the newspapers about three, um, and I hope people will forgive me going into some detail, three very interesting developments globally. Um, the first was that the, uh, the Chinese are dramatically increasing the size of their navy. Um, they're building um, new installations on the Sprackley Islands, which um, some of you may know um, uh, dominate the South, or give the potential to dominate the South China Sea. Um, and they're, they're rapidly increasing both their surface and their submarine fleet. Uh, in order to meet that challenge, both Australia and Vietnam are investing in increasing the size of their navy. Vietnam is buying uh, Russian submarines, the Australians are increasing the size of their own navy as well. Um, and all three nations, I think, are doing so because they recognize that in different ways, securing, um, uh, they're all maritime states, securing um, uh, safe passage for their goods and for their people matters. And that means that they have to keep their own navies in, in good repair. Um, and seeing what's happening globally, I think that has to um, influence us as well. There is no nation that relies more on keeping the arteries of trade healthy than the United Kingdom. And that means that we have to play our part in making sure that threats, whether they're terror threats, piracy threats, or other threats, are met robustly. And I think that will mean making sure that we've got a, a navy which is appropriate for the 21st century in the same way as those other countries. Thank you. Just coming to more parochial things, mm. I believe the Prime Minister, at, when he addressed the CST, mm. promised an extra, I think, three million pounds for security for synagogues. Yes. Um, it, it, how is that money going to be allocated? And is it going to be allocated to CST? And is it going to be six hundred thousand pounds for each year of the Parliament? How is it going to work? I, I don't know all the detail. 
Um, Matthew was one of the people who persuaded the Prime Minister to make this investment. And it's a, it's, it, it is a success for a campaign which I know the JC, but also Matthew, um, had led. Matthew behind the scenes had talked to uh, the Home Secretary and to the Prime Minister in order to ensure that we had this significant additional expenditure. I think that it's going to be distributed in consultation with the CSD. How precise the money will be distributed, I'm afraid I don't know. I think the first, the first point I want to make is that my very first question in Parliament was to Michael, and I asked him about school security. And he responded by saying that he very much felt that it was appropriate that the government paid for this, and just because of someone's faith, it did not mean that they should be paying the security costs of, of keeping everyone safe. So he came up with the first £2 million for schools. I've been campaigning since, since that time um, to ensure that that funding continues. Uh, I was very pleased at the CST dinner that the Prime Minister said not only that he would ensure that the £2 million would remain, but he increased it to £13 million. Um, Mike Freer and I, the, the former member in Pinch and Golders Group, have been working very hard to ensure that it's not only the state schools, but also independent schools um, are actually protected. Now, I don't believe that uh, the Labour Party actually agreed with the independent side, but I'm very pleased that happened. Michael and I also argued for synagogues to be protected, and we also argued for Jewish cultural centres such as JW3 and the Finchley Road, because I'm sure every time you drive past you see they have people protecting them there, and they felt they were our own risk. And after last summer, um, I had certainly several meetings with constituents uh, around Edgeware, and uh, people put it across to me that they felt genuinely unsafe in their own communities, and, and I find it unacceptable. And so that's why I was very, very pleased and very keen to actually lobby the government. I'm, I'm very proud that we've been successful upon that. The CST will, CST will administer the money. They will do it in consultation with the synagogues and in the schools and any other places. They will look at uh, any perceived risks, uh, as they do already, uh, and they will spend the money as appropriate uh, to ensure that everyone remains safe in our community. So it's the CST who are to be in charge? They are the auditor, yeah. And I'm just fascinated, especially about the security, how responsible the responsive we are to the need for security. Where is the work going and who is doing the work in order to prevent the need for security by actually creating an environment that people should be able to live freely and do what they want? It ties into a certain extent, not directly, with another question I had about the fascinating exchange we had a moment ago revolving around personality politics and how the Jewish community over the centuries always re relied on personality politics rather than ide ideology politics, creating ideas that become shared. In many ways we've been very successful in sharing um, much of Western thought and Western values that come out of the Jewish community. But nevertheless, at the moment, it seems there are certain aspects of it, um, personal responsibility, um, obligations rather than rights and demands, certain values that were key to the framing of Western values that have gotten lost. And what do you propose to do about creating an environment and a society where you don't need a, don't have a need for security, but rather the conversation actually is a different one about people's obligations and responsibilities. Good question. <laughs> it's a huge question. Um, uh, uh, let me take it in two elements. I think the principal security threat that Jewish institutions face now um, are, is from uh, radical Islamists and those who are influenced by them. Uh, there'll be some people who will just be uh, ignorant and whose prejudice will be directed by um, uh, what they hear without really understanding the you know, ideology behind it. There'll be others who buy into the ideology fully um, and who, uh, as radicalismists have, um, uh, in any country where they've operated, uh, they've taken the Jewish community and the Jewish population as the first target. So what we need to do is to counter the Islamist ideology and narrative. And the Prime Minister has been very clear um, in some of the arguments he's made, not just in platforms like the Community Security Trust um, uh, dinner, but also in the House of Commons um, and when speaking abroad about the need to uh, tackle at source what this ideology stands for. Sorry to interrupt. For many years, the only place you can get 
a copy of Mein Kampf in this country was in various Arab embassies. Mm. That's where you could buy it and it was freely available. We don't seem to find that these issues of the deliberate anti-Jewish policies that exist within those environments are tackled as publicly and directly, perhaps, as they need to be. So just following on that one as well, our youngsters are becoming increasingly threatened on campus. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The uh, rabid uh, anti-Zionism, which is going to get to anti-Semitism, is just another name. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you see every other week another university that's hosting a speaker under the auspices of free speech and human rights, etc., mm -hmm. which just is so slanted and uh, uh, unacceptable. But it's just allowed to happen. Two things to take. Just on one of the things, a very important point. Um, some of you may have been aware that Southampton University was planning to organise a conference. It wasn't really a conference, it was basically an anti Israel hate fest. Uh, with no, all the speakers there were debating how the Israeli state could be dismantled and eradicated, not whether or not it was a good thing. Um, if I uh, uh, organised a conference where I said, well, there was another state that was created by partition in the 1940s. Uh, to, in fact, India and Pakistan. Let's have a conference on how we can dismantle them. Then I, I think people quite rightly would say that's not about academic freedom, that's about uh, fostering an atmosphere of political hate. Um, and and that, that shouldn't operate under the auspices of you know universities having free debate. And Southampton and I cancelled this event because they realised that it wasn't a proper debate, it was agitation. Um, and Theresa May has been arguing consistently goes back to one of the constraints of coalition, that we need to have an extremism policy, which all institutions buy into, which mean that speakers who may be peddling extremism, not necessarily violent extremism, but the sort of extremism that, that justifies prejudice and hate, particularly towards the Jewish people, that institutions should um, accept that they have a responsibility to police those speakers, and sometimes to say that they're not welcome in these institutions. Um, there was a particularly poignant example recently when uh, the University of Westminster, the university which the gentleman Mohammed al Mawazi, known as Jihadi John, went to on the day that uh, Jihadi John's identity is um, you know, uh, publicly revealed, that very same day the University of Westminster was due to have a speaker who was an Islamist who had justified hatred towards others and uh, justified physical violence towards women, including female genital mutilation. Um, and the idea that it would be a suitable thing for a university to do to give a platform to someone like that, to speak unchallenged, is, is quite wrong. And Theresa has been very clear, I think perhaps the bravest politician in Britain, in saying that this needs to be confronted. But it comes back to an earlier plea that I made. In order to ensure that Theresa can bring those changes about and deal with the problems that Rabbi and others identified, we need to make sure that we have people in Parliament who agree with her and who support her. Um, and that's why I think it's so important that if we can, that we get a Conservative majority. Can I come back? Yes. Come back on that point. Mm -hmm. It seems that what is needed is something like a PR department of government which specialises in public relations with a view to presenting things in a way that would persuade the public and, and sections of the public of uh, a more um, a reasonable attitude. Is there any plan? For, is there any such department at the moment? And if not, is there any plan to set up such a department? There is within the Home Office. Theresa <coughs> has um, uh, helped um, uh, reinforce this in an organisation called Ofriku, R I C U, um, uh, and it deliberately sets out to persuade uh, people who are tempted by uh, radicalism, Islamism, jihadi thought. Uh, it sets out to persuade them of the virtues of um, democratic values. It's also the case that they uh, prevent strand of work within the Home Office um, has people on the ground prevent coordinators in areas where there are large numbers of people who may be susceptible to this ideology and it tries to work with schools, with social workers and others in order to counter this. Can I just say something about the counter-terrorism security bill which we've legislated recently? Um, I went to the West End and Mosque on Friday where we had a, an election hustings and I have to say I found it really very interesting and one of the best debates I've, I've been involved in. And 
what I was able to put across to people there is that the Counterterrorism Security Bill is protecting those people who are Muslims in this country from being tarnished as extremists, and they certainly are not there in West Ham. And I was able to say how this bill is actually protecting young people, just like the three girls that have gone out to Syria. Uh, and I put that across very forcefully, and I think people get that. This is about protecting people in this country, as well as indeed people who go over overseas as well. So that's very important. I was very dismayed that my Labour opponent said that he would not have voted for the Counterterrorism Security Bill. Um, and he said he would amend it and he would, would not have gone along with it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was very surprised. Mm -hmm. But it is not only about keeping, as I say, uh, everyone safe, it's also about keeping Muslim people safe in this country. But the point I wanted to make um, about the counterterrorism security bill, there's a specific clause in there that places an obligation on universities to address radicalisation on campus. And it be that anti Zionism that spills over into anti Semitism. Uh, there is now an obligation on vice chancellors of universities to actually do that. This is law. This is, yes. How, how people, sorry, uh, uh, the how people, how much funding is there for this group? Rigid, RSC. I can't report, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to the team and, and so they can um, let you know how RICU is funded and, and how much is spent on prevent as well. Yeah, I just wanted to talk, just to move the topic, I don't know if it's been touched on, um, particularly Mr. Goh, given your experience in the history of education. My understanding, my perception of um, how Ofsted have evolved in their um, ability to do on the spot inspections, which I know you, you, you championed, um, uh, in light of what was found in Birmingham, mm -hmm. has allowed them to be great, uh, have a great, uh, have a great empowerment to investigate and assess and evaluate the schools. I think from what I've seen talking to some schools in the area, some Jewish schools in the area, perhaps some of the collateral damage has been a, a little bit more of an assertive, uh, aggressive approach by the inspectors in assessing the Jewish schools with the slight prejudice and expectation that perhaps a faith school isn't quite as um, favourably looked at as it was before. Uh, and it's resulted in a number of schools being given quite, um, quite negative reports. For example, JFS has been brought down uh, two levels. JFS, as you know, is, is a school of 2,000 pupils. Um, I think last year put 16 to 18 kids in Roxbridge. So it's not a, certainly, a, I think, fairly on a league table basis up there. Um, and therefore, there's a perception, certainly, uh, far more time is being spent by headmasters, headmistress, principals of a lot of these space schools in being able to uh, um, be prepared in dealing with offset inquiries and a lot of the times they're being brought down by perhaps more to a non-academic aspects of the evaluation list. Um, so there's, on the teaching side, professional uh, staff side, there's certainly <coughs> something that um, as a result of the Birmingham affair Whilst they're getting a lot more criticism results not picking that up, the collateral damage in the assessment of Jewish space schools has become far more prejudiced. I wondered if that was your perception, if not, how the next Tory administration uh, should it be in place to be able to practically balance um, Ofsted's approach. You agree? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I want to hear the Jews in class. The, the first thing I should say is that the perception that you, you allude to, I certainly know, is, is um, widely shared. Um, but I, 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 I'd say a number of things. The first is that um, in the aftermath of what we discovered in Birmingham, we knew that Ofsted uh, did need, from time to time, to have unannounced inspections, because it can sometimes be the case if you've got people running the school who are as some of the people in Birmingham were, tried to to smuggle an ideology under the cloak of raising standards, you need to be able to call at a time when they can't rearrange the way in which the school is run to mask what they're up to. The second thing is that in the wake of uh, what we discovered in Birmingham, uh, we reinforced the principle that there should be um, a respect for uh, fundamental British values um, at the heart of every school. Um, and that, of course, involves um, respect for tolerance, the rule of law, democracy, and other things. And I don't think there's a single Jewish school in the country, certainly not that I have visited, there's anything other than a brilliant beacon for British values. And it's certainly every Jewish school that I've ever visited 
manages simultaneously to combine a respect for the tradition of the Jewish faith with an understanding of modern British society, which is exemplar. Um, with those schools that have been marked down, um, I don't know about any of the individual cases, but it is sometimes the case um, that schools which have been good or outstanding for a while sometimes uh, tend to, uh, and again, I don't want to make comments about any individual school, sometimes tend to be a little bit complacent, rest on their laurels, and sometimes are surprised that other schools have been improving faster than they have, and therefore their, 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 their previous outstanding status is no longer as merited as it used to be. Um, but I've also asked Ofsted and um, uh, education ministers about uh, whether or not some of the cases that have been highlighted, where there appears to have been uh, uh, a marking down of the school because it hasn't followed British values and in fact it's been a, an example of school, and it, it does that uh, uh, check out. And I've been assured, actually, no. Uh, some people who, uh, whose schools were uh, performing uh, less well than they should have done uh, thought that perhaps because there was a new element in the inspection procedure, it was because they filled out that they were doing less well. And in fact, they were confusing um, a new element in the inspection uh, criteria with their uh, weaknesses elsewhere. That's what I've been assured, but of course, I'll continue to remain vigilant. Can I just add to that question? Because I want to give you another aspect of defence schools that concerns a lot of people, and not just about um, this is Ofsted uh, inspectors and their conduct, which you've been said but also issues at the admission policies of school. And where mm -hmm. there have been issues that have been a problem, yes. sometimes perceived in our community, and maybe other religious communities as well, is that uh, there are those who want to try and get schools to admit those from other faiths yes. into their schools, certainly the state-controlled schools. There is a certain push to do this, and even with, uh, in the Conservative Party, there have been voices that have said that. Yes. That is something that is unacceptable to, I'm sure, other faiths too, to like a Catholic school would want people to be there who are Catholics, and a Jewish school wants people to be there Jewish, and a Muslim school, and so on and so forth. And many of us see nothing wrong with that. But there's this multicultural attitude of pluralism and social cohesion <coughs> and expressions that tries to work against it. And I can comment on that. And also, there's one other thing, mm -hmm. is the question of how religious schools teach their syllabus. We worry a little bit that Jewish schools are being tarred with the brush that may be applied to some of the Islamic mm -hmm. schools. And, it is, and this is unfair. We want the right, and other religions should have the right to teach their religion as they wish, and not have to teach other people's religions, unless they want to, and, and assuming their religion doesn't teach anything which is, which is violence or, or hatred. We said people would never do that, mm. and other religions also wouldn't. So, can you comment on that? We feel that religious syllabus is inevitable. And one final point is about sex education. Mm. I think this is also an important area. Although there are many, many people who feel that sex education is very important for children, others have different views. We respect the views that the majority of politics is, is a good idea. But a lot of religious people, and even who are not religious, don't think that it is a good idea that children at a young age um, should have sex education and that it should be something which should be enforced even for children of an older age. Mm. It should be up to the school itself. And religious schools, certainly our Orthodox Jewish schools, do not believe that sex education is appropriate. They believe in other methods of children finding out, and thank God they normally do find out in the right way, and our stability of marriages and our lifestyle tend to indicate that it works. So could you kind of assure us, or give us your view, on whether you feel that there shouldn't be interference on these things? On the first thing with admissions, one of the difficulties that arose um, was uh, as a result of the Supreme Court judgment in the, in the case of JFS. Um, I, 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 I think it is wrong for uh, the Supreme Court to rule on uh, how a faith decides whether or not someone is of that faith. It's a symmetric principle. Um, so um, I, I, I think the judges were wrong. Um, on the second point about um, uh, religious education, um, I think it is right that if people are studying religious education at GCSE, as well as studying their own faith as part of it, um, there should be an obligation to study uh, at least one other faith alongside it. Um, it's perfectly possible for people to uh, study their own faith and to have lessons in their own faith and to choose not to do religious education, GCSE, that's fine. But for a, uh, a, a qualification, which is a state qualification in uh, a religious education, which takes a philosophy and ethics, then I think that you need to have one other faith um, taught alongside uh, what might be your own faith. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Would you, would you suggest that one of those faiths could be secular religion? No, <laughs> secularism is not well. I mean, it's an ideology of faith. No, you, you can study philosophy, but my, my, my view is that um, 
Um, uh, for those of you who are interested, um, I should say that in the latest issue of the Spectator, I would have at least about uh, um, it's only three pounds. That's why you care. All, all proceeds go to regulars. Um, but but uh, no, you, you, you need to you know, proper respect. Um, and then the third point relates to sex education. Um, uh, because this has been criticised by some parties, because we've said that um, uh, there should be no compulsory sex education in primary school. Um, uh, the other parties say it should be absolutely compulsory in primary school. We say no, sex education should be age appropriate. Um, it's part of the national curriculum at key stage three that people learn the basics of human biology. It's also the case that any school, if it wishes to, can have as part of its personal, social, uh, health, and economic education consideration of relationships and, of course, consideration of uh, sexual morality and ethics. But there is an abs There are two obligations. One, a school should shape its sex and relationships education curriculum in consultation with parents through the governing body. And secondly, every parent has an absolute right to withdraw their child from sex education if they consider it inappropriate. So therefore, for any, any particular state faith school, they will, I'm sure, uh, decide um, what is the appropriate sort of, um, you know, the, the, the straightforward human biology, the plumbing, the birds and the bees, and the ethics that goes with it. Um, and parents will choose a school on that basis. And if any individual parent feels as a matter of conscience that that's inappropriate, then they have that absolute right to withdraw. And that is something which um, we have safeguarded, even though both Labour and Liberal Democrats have criticised us for it, because we believe that it's very important to respect the wishes of individual parents and the wishes of faith communities uh, to ensure that they, the moral principles that they believe are important are passed on to the next generation in town. Thank you. Right, it's going to be just a few minutes now, five or ten minutes or so, we're going to finish the meeting. We've been asked to wind up around. Uh, our guests have other commitments, and uh, I'm sure we all have our commitments as well. So it's been a very good meeting so far. I want to ask Matthew, our candidate, um, one of our candidates, one of the several candidates in this constituency, uh, and our former Conservative MP, to say a few words, and uh, this is your opportunity, Thank Matthew. So, uh, well, as, as the, go the Conservative candidate in this, in this election, um, that's certainly my role. I wanted to say just a couple of things. First of all, for someone who didn't have a good education, I had a very poor education. I'm very grateful for Michael's work in the Department of Education when he was Secretary of State. He certainly showed not only his commitment to the profession, uh, but he also showed a real passion for learning amongst our, our young people. And I'm very grateful for what he did in, in that role. Um, I'm also very grateful for the fact that um, under his stewardship, he actually protected modern Hebrew as a language to be taught in stage two. Um, I'm also very grateful for the school security, which you were, you were very kind uh, enough to provide the money that as was appropriate. And indeed, for other education reforms that you conducted. So I'm very grateful for that. I have to say, as, as Chief Whip, I'm supposed to be scared of the Chief Whip. Uh, but uh, the reality is, in modern day politics, uh, the role of the Chief Whip isn't what it was in the past. And I have to say that not only uh, was Michael, but also great hands have been fantastic as the Whips. Certainly been very supportive to colleagues and to myself, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I certainly do not intend to vote against any Conservative government if I'm elected, <laughs> and I certainly look forward to us working together and to achieving a Conservative majority in the next Parliament, and I hope to be very much one of them. So thank you for coming, Henry. You've been a great friend of the community. Thank you. You've been a great friend to this area. And uh, I certainly hope to, to work with you in the future. So thank you, Michael. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that meeting will be complete with Rabbi yeah. President Manasa. Uh, some words of uh, spiritual input, maybe good about Tony, who knows it's a very important time for us. Rabbi Lieberman, you can talk to you. You sure you did, did <laughs> The most important spiritual value that I can sense of what we call in Hebrew Hakar Sato, which is appreciation of goodness done to the Jewish community, to an individual. And I think we as a Jewish community have a tremendous sense of Hakar Sato, recognition of the good that Mr. Go, you have exemplified in everything you've done in so, in so many different ways. Um, for myself, it's always been very important how you were amongst the first to speak up about Islamic anti-Semitism and Islamic um, extremism 
in this country and throughout the world and the dangers that manifest, have manifest themselves in the last several years, specifically. Um, your ideals that you've espoused over numerous years have been the ones that we as a community have shared and really thank you for that. Mr. Alfred, you've been an MP for this community for, and thank God you, again, have reflected our needs and done what you can for our community. We thank you for that. We thank you for the esteem you give us for actually worrying enough to come here and talk to us and value and listen to what we have to say. Um, I'd love to give speeches about all those things, but I'm not a politician, so <laughs> maybe I am. <laughs> but there's slightly different. An American style politician. But really, thank you very much for everything. Thank you for coming. As I said, it would be an honor for you to join us at one of the services, let's say tomorrow night. It would be an honor for you to come and join us, and then you'll indeed find the crowds that you see. Thank you very much. God manages to get him in for himself. Can I just mention something totally uh, 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 mechanical, if you are, a little clinical, but important, administrative, and that is if anybody needs to get a postal vote, and this is totally non party political, so as a local councillor, as far as anybody wouldn't say so, anybody who needs a postal vote or a proxy vote, you have not very much time left. It's now April, to the 20th of April, but beyond to the coming, the other thing in our mind, just don't forget, if you've got any children, people are going to be out of the country, university, or out of the Shiva, wherever they stay. Please let me know quickly. I'll easily supply you with forms. You can get them on the website. The easiest to is that I'll give you the forms. You can fill them in and get them into the administration. It's important to give it It's very important to everybody. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 This thing? Yeah, yeah, this is the service department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but when a journalist, we say, is accredited, is there a sort of, is it the 